We're ready to present, so I suggest you take your seats and listen. Immediately following Chris's presentation, it's requested that those that have worked closely with Chris in their own lives, think they've worked closely with Chris over the years, gather around and there will be a group picture with Chris up there on the stage. Now who's the next group? Presenters. And immediately after that picture, the presenters will gather up here for their picture. Otherwise, Dr. Owens will be very upset with you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure this noon to bring you the favorite speaker across the world on stage, radio, television. What did I miss? Internet. And a great instructor at the uh, University of South Carolina. Writer of six books. I can't think of anything greater to say about her. Chris. My husband. My husband used to say that you could go to hell for lying like you could for cheating and stealing, George. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here um, to see a lot of old friends and to make new friends. Um, it's been a long, in fact, at my age, I'm glad to be anywhere. <laughs> uh, I am a storyteller. I think all history is a story. Now, the topic I'm covering today has been ricocheting around my brain for about 20 years. Since I read of, King, of uh, Queen Elizabeth's statement at the American Independence Bicentennial in Philadelphia, July the 6th, 1976. And she said, we lost the American colonies because we lacked the statesmanship to know the time and manner to yield what it is impossible to keep. I want to read that one more time because it's terribly important. We lost the American colonies because we lacked the statesmanship to know the time and manner to yield what it is impossible to keep. Now, she's not blaming the British Army or the British Navy for losing the war. She's blaming Parliament and possibly King George. Now, I had read John Cook's book, The Long Fuse, How England Lost the American Colonies. How how England lost the American colonies, and he covers a parliament from 1760 to 1785. Now, I like his metaphor, the long fuse, because in his words, when the king decided to levy taxes on the colonists, he lit the fuse. And from that point on, he and his parliament fanned the flames until it exploded into war. Now a good story has villains and heroes. And you people all know who the heroes are in this war. But today I want to talk about the villains. The primary one being, of course, King George III. Now he kept meticulous notes. And they were edited and published in six volumes by Sir John Fortescue, who also wrote this opinion. Quote, it was the king who prodded government into acts that led to war, refusing all thoughts of conciliation or compromise with the colonists. 
Now the first act, of course, that lit the fuse was the Stamp Act of 1765. And it affected all the colonists. And the most egregious part of it was you had to pay taxes on it, everything they imported from England. And of course the colonists solved the problem, they just refused to buy. So there were ships in dock, on American dock, uh, ports uh, loaded with produce and products, except, except the tea, you know where the tea went. <laughs> but in England, merchants and shippers were angry because they were financially suffering. And eventually, they overthrew the Tory government, um, the King's party, the Tory party, that would always do what the King wanted. And so the Whigs took over. And the new Prime Minister was a very young man, uh, Marcus Rockingham, and he immediately repealed the Stamp Act, infuriated the King, King took everything personally. Now, he needed, the king needed to get his Tory party back. And he chose Lord North, and he's our second villain. Capable, well-respected, he took over the Tory party and ousted Rockingham. Now, Lord North was not a wartime uh, prime minister, and he knew it. And when the war came about, he wanted to resign. And he wanted to resign over and over and over again, and the king refused to let him. The king needed him to hold that party together. So who was running the war? Lord Germain, the secretary of the American colonies. He would direct the war. He was not without military experience. And he is this his is a very interesting story. During the Seven Years' War, he had been a Lieutenant General, three stars. His name at that time was Lord Sackville. And at the Battle of Minden in 1759, he was in charge of the British cavalry. Now, the battle was commanded by a Prince uh, Ferdinand of, of Brunswick. And he fought well. And he had the French on the ropes. And he ordered Sackville to charge. And Sackville did not. Um, the French left the field in good order, lived to fight again another day. And eventually, Sackville did charge, but the French were gone. <laughs> um, Ferdinand was unhappy and he complained to the British government and they were embarrassed. They stripped Sackville of his rank and booted him out of the army. Now, he wanted a court-martial. Now, a court-martial, if they found him guilty, could order a death penalty and have him shot. But he was confident. He should not have been. Most of the officers who were his contemporaries hated him. They held him in utter contempt. And the court kept talking about cowardice, treachery, treason. And they did find him guilty, but they didn't impose a death penalty. And that's too bad. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway um, he, uh, he was charged guilty, and he was judged, quote, unfit to serve his majesty, that would have been George II at that time, in any military capacity whatever. And so Sackville went back to Ireland and rebranded himself and returns as Lord Germain. Now, he had convinced the king that he could he could defeat the colonists, but he could punish them. And the king was big on punishing. Now, Germain is now relieving officers, assigning commands, um, ordering campaigns, issuing battle plans, and all of this from London. 
to a group of senior officers in America, many of whom utter him, or hold him in utter contempt. And Germain had an agenda, and he had a few people he wanted to punish, and he was not above, above, above settling old scores. Now, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Everything. The war was not going well, and the Whig Party kept warning Parliament that if the French thought it was advantageous, they would declare war on England. Well, after the defeat of Major General John Burgoyne at Saratoga, and he surrendered his <coughs> army, France did exactly that. But also, Spain and Holland declared war on England. And so now, what started as a family squabble is now an international war. But Germain had plans, and it was the Southern Campaign. The only problem was he had to get it funded by Parliament because they held the purse strings. And so, how do you get it through Parliament? There was a lot of unrest about the war. It was supposed to be a quick fix, and now it's still dragging on. Many British soldiers had gone to the colonies and had died either in battle or of infection or disease. Taxes had gone up tenfold, and they're paying for 30,000 troops that they have rented from the Germans. And uh, generals thought they needed another 30,000, and Charles James Fox, a vitriolic speaker who was a Whig, kept saying, a hundred thousand Germans cannot win the war, the war is unwinnable. And so with that kind of a problem, how do you get Parliament to fund another campaign? Well, if you're Germain, you lie. And he did. And he argued they could still win a lot if they took the South, even if they let New England go. Now, would the king have let New England go? Absolutely not, but he wasn't pitching this to the king. He was pitching this to Parliament. And New England had started building ships. They had quite a, a robust shipping industry. They were starting to manufacture. In other words, they were competition for England. And they produced nothing that England couldn't get elsewhere. So they were perfectly happy to do away with New England, but why bother with the South? Well, if you think about it, the British had a great navy. They had a huge merchant navy, and those boats or those ships were wooden under sail. They needed virgin timber for the mass. They needed lumber, turpentine, and tar to build or repair ships. They needed hemp for the rope, for the rigging. And they needed fabric for the sails. And the South had it all in abundance. But the second argument was, well, we have slaves in the South uh, growing rice. We can ship that rice to the West Indies and feed the slaves that are making sugar. Now, the products of the West Indies were the most important, richest of all the, American, of the British colonies. Uh, you know, the Brits like their sugar and molasses. They like their sweets. But the byproduct, rum, was the, as good as gold. And much of the wealth of shippers and merchants and investors and people who sat in Parliament based on rum. And so they funded the Southern Campaign with the understanding this is going to be the last money that we're going to put up into this war because England was running out of funds. And so you know what happened in the Southern Campaign. It went very well for a while. It took 
Georgia returned it to a royal colony, and Clinton took Charleston, and he put um, he selected a sites around the area to uh, uh, the British soldiers to provide safety for the friends of the king, hoping to train militia that could hold the territory while the British army went north. Now Clinton, we know from his papers, never believed that this was going to work. He did not believe that there were that there was an, enough strength um, in the militia. Um, they didn't have the, the numbers or the ability to replace the British Army. So he wanted out. He didn't like the South. He didn't like the heat and the humidity and the bugs and the disease. And so he went back to the comfort of his apartments in New York City and his mistress, leaving Lord Cornwallis in charge. Now, it's hard to tell what Cornwallis thought of Germain. They were contemporaries. He certainly knew Germain's, uh, Germain's background. But He knew that Germain had the ear of the king. And so it would be expedient to ingratiate yourself to ingratiate yourself Germain. So Cornwallis, instead of reporting to Clinton, his superior officer in New York, sent his reports directly to Germain in London. It took about six weeks another six weeks to get back. But Lord Cornwallis was feeding his information to Germain, who was reporting to Parliament. Why didn't Parliament know about Brattonsville, Blackstocks, Musgrove's Mill, Kings Mountain, even Cowpens? Because Cornwallis wasn't there and Cornwallis was describing to Germain his campaign. And so the next thing, uh, early on, uh, Parliament got the news that Cornwallis had taken, first he'd taken Camden without firing a shot. He had defeated uh, the, the Continental Army, driven them well north of, uh, in, into North Carolina and then was moved to Charlotte. And Parliament was excited. They had a new heart hero. General Cornwallis was going to win the war for them. Now, this was going to be a, a serious problem because it took a while for Cornwallis to have another big victory. But his next big victory was Guilford Courthouse. And when Parliament heard about Guilford Courthouse, they were really excited because now Cornwallis is headed for Wilmington. He's going to get refitted and resupplied and is beyond his way to Virginia. Parliament is really excited and very optimistic about the war. And so, well, I've got this thing. Uh, Sorry about this, got things rearranged. Anyway, they uh, they kept uh, moving. Well, they kept reporting to uh, uh, Parliament how well Lord Cornwallis was doing. Did they ever hear about Nathaniel Green? Well, they maybe knew that uh, Cornwallis had defeated him. But Nathaniel Green is described as having a superior mind and a Herculean memory. Jack Buchanan refers to him as cerebral. And he certainly was a very brilliant man. After the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, Green, who knew how much um, the British lost in the South, how many soldiers, whatever, 
and he knew that they were hemorrhaging blood, money, material, and men, and they could not keep it up. And Green reasoned that if Congress would stay the course, the Americans would win because England would have to quit. But when they quit, they got to hold everything they occupied. It would, because now it would be an international treaty because it was an international war. And so Green did not follow Cornwallis to Wilmington. He turned south to take back the south, as much territory as he could before England had to end the war. And you know how his campaign went. Um, as David said, you know, we, we fight, we defeat, we fight again, and all of that. But what was Cornwallis doing? After Wilmington, he went to Virginia. And were uh, campaigning with Tarleton and now um, a British general called Benedict Arnold, they did extremely well. And Parliament was aware of this. And they expected any day to hear that the war was over, that Cornwallis had won it. Now, the 8th of September, Green was at Utah Springs. And he had moved the British out of the, pretty much the back country up to there. Now, it doesn't matter who you think won the Battle of, of Utah Springs, because after that battle, the British retreated into the Charleston area. And all England owned then it's an area around Savannah and an area around Charleston. Nathaniel Green had taken the rest of it back. Now while Green was at Utah Springs in, in that campaign, uh, the French Navy, <coughs> excuse me, that had been uh, attacking uh, islands in the West Indies. They too wanted the rum. And the weather was getting bad, so they turned north, and they encountered Lord Cornwallis' fleet that was, uh, that was re re refitting uh, Cornwallis at Yorktown. And they defeated the British fleet at what we call the Battle of the Bays, of the Capes, but uh, that was in the Chesapeake Bay area and the French inflicted tremendous damage on the British fleet, which limped back to New York to get refitted or whatever, leaving Lord Cornwallis stranded at Yorktown. Now, five weeks after Utah Springs, the combined forces of George Washington and Rochambeau forced Cornwallis to defeat it, to uh, surrender his army. And uh, they had completely annihilated uh, poor Cornwallis's expectations of grandeur. Now, it usually would take about six weeks to get the word back across the ocean, north, the North Atlantic, and a fast French frigate left right after the battle and went to France. And the word got to France the 19th of November. And Ben Franklin was there. And he, with his portable printing press, and he printed out brochures and sent them to all his friends in Paris, and a British traveler there uh, took one to Lord Germain in London. And Lord Germain um, immediately called on uh, the Lord North first, and then they went to tell the king. Now, 
word spread rapidly, especially among the members of the parliament. And Cook writes, as far as London knew, General Cornwallis had marched from Charleston to Virginia coast on virtually a virtual trail of success. How could this have happened? Well, they were about to, reset, uh, to reconvene in a couple of days, and the king would address them, and surely the king would explain what had happened. And two days later, when the king spoke, he never mentioned Cornwallis, and he never mentioned Yorktown. He said, we're going to put a stronger commander in New York, meet Washington on the field, defeat him, and win this war. And Parliament began to be awakened to the fact that Germain is a problem because he is encouraging the king in this unreasonable, irrational denial of what the situation really is. And so when they reconvene after Christmas, um, they shun Germain. And Parliament, uh, the cabinet won't meet because Germain would be there and so they weren't going to deal with him. And this took weeks. And finally, the king settled the problem. No one could fire Germain because of wartime powers. Even the king couldn't dismiss him. But the king decided on a general to replace Clinton in New York. Now, up until now, Germain would have made those decisions. But whether the king did it inadvertently or deliberately is a question. But he selected Sir Guy Carleton. And Carleton and Germain had been mortal enemies through their entire careers. Now, Carleton was not a likable person, really. Uh, difficult, arrogant, and uh, I guess that went with the territory. But he had a recent um, beef with uh, Germain because early in the war, Sir Guy Carleton had commanded the British troops in Canada, and Germain had forced him out, had given the command of that army to uh, General John Burgoyne, and that army had been uh, surrendered at Saratoga, and were now spending another winter in a prison camp in York, Pennsylvania, which is not a pleasant winter holiday. And Carleton, as difficult an individual as he was, was a soldier's general. And he was furious that his army, his soldiers, his men, had been humiliated and suffered this defeat. And Germain tried to change the king's mind, but the king was adamant. And if Carleton is in, Germain is out, and Germain knew it. And he offered to resign if the king would advance or promote him to a peerage that would allow him to sit in the House of, of Lords. And the king made him a viscount, and he took the name Sackville again. But Parliament didn't want him. The House of Lords tried everything to keep him out, but he finally went in to take his seat to boos and catcalls and things thrown at him, and probably language that was rarely heard above deck. <laughs> and, but he was very thick-skinned. He took his seat. He didn't do much in Parliament, but he took his seat. Now, the Tories lost the government in March of 1782. And who is the Prime Minister? <coughs> Rockingham. Remember, he had repealed the Stamp Act. The king still had it in for him and would not meet with him. And he couldn't install a cabinet without meeting with the king. So they had to have a go-between. And the go-between was the Earl of Shelburne. And so he went between Parliament and the 
prime minister and the king. Well, Charmaine, I'm sorry, um, Shelburne and Rockingham were agreed. No, England is the loser in this war, and they're going to have to deal with Spain and Holland and France. But before they did, they thought it would be a good idea to see what the colonists wanted. 